Hi and welcome back to Doc Off Call. My name is Dr. Maddie and I'm one of your doctors from the UK. To celebrate the release of the new Spider-Man trailer, we're going to be taking a look back at some of the origin stories of some of Spider-Man's greatest villains. To start off with, we're going to be looking at the origin of Dr. Otto Octavius, otherwise known as Doc Ock. And if you want to see me break down the origins of any other Spider-Man villains, please do leave their name down below in the comments. Otherwise, give this video a like. Let's begin. These smart arms are controlled by my brain through a neural link. Nanowires feed directly into my cerebellum, allowing me to use these arms to control fusion reaction in an environment no human hand could enter. So in this first scene, Doc Ock talks about how these nanowires feed into a part of his brain called the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum is also known as the little brain, and if we look at a diagram of this in comparison to the brain at large, you can see why. The cerebellum almost looks like a miniature version of the bigger brain that we call the cerebrum. Now the cerebrum, or the bigger brain, is involved in interpreting all of the information that the body receives before giving some sort of action through the motor cortex. Whereas the cerebellum is more of a precise processing unit that helps to coordinate fine movements and your coordination. Doctor, if the artificial intelligence in the arms is as advanced as you suggest, uh, couldn't that make you vulnerable to them? How right you are. Which is why I developed this inhibitor chip to protect my higher brain function. And there we go. If that's not foreshadowing for what's going to happen, then I don't know what is. I mean, he says here, the one thing preventing this AI from taking over my brain is this inhibitory chip. I wonder what would happen if that got damaged. But what Doc Ock is talking about here is protecting his higher brain functions. And what he means by these higher brain functions are all conscious mental activities, such as thinking, remembering, reasoning, and all complex behaviors such as speaking or communicating and carrying out purposeful movement. And it's important to note that all of these higher brain functions are controlled in the cerebrum and not the cerebellum. So effectively this chip is preventing the infiltration of these nanofibers into the bigger brain. And of course, we see this inhibitory chip get fried. And this movie is well ahead of its time, considering it's 17 years old. We have people now like Elon Musk talking about Neuralink and integrating artificial intelligence into the human body. So it's pretty amazing how this uh, movie went on to predict what we're doing today. As you can see, molten metal penetrated the spinal cavity and fused the vertebra at multiple points, including the lamina and the roof of the spinal column. Okay, and we can see that Doc Ock has been taken straight to the operating room, and it looks like they're going to attempt to remove these machine arms. And interestingly, they seem to have some radiographic images here of Doc Ock's back. And I'm guessing they're trying to make this look like an x-ray, comparing it to things that I've seen. But one thing that's funny here is how they depicted the metal, with the bolts included. And this is funny because if we compare it to x-rays where metal is in fact on screen, you can see that it appears radio opaque or very bright white. And this is because the metal doesn't allow x-rays to pass through them. We won't know the extent of the damage until we get in there, so I suggest we cut off these mechanical arms, slice up the harness, and if need be, consider a laminectomy. And I like how everything here is covered in drapes. We commonly do this in the operating room to keep things sterile and clean. Speaking of which, I can see that all of the operating staff are gowned up. They've got their hair nets on and face masks and all of these operating gowns as well. And that's for the very same reason, to keep things as clean as possible. And then we have this head surgeon suggests that they're going to perform what's called a laminectomy. And if we break this term down, you have lamina and ectomy. So the lamina are bony parts of the vertebral bodies and ectomy means removal. So together, laminectomy means removal of the lamina part of the vertebral body. And this procedure is commonly performed to help better visualize the spinal cord and also to help relieve any pressure that's placed on some of the spinal nerves. 
right back. We're ready, doctor. Anybody here take shop class? <laughs> 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 okay, I didn't quite get that joke, but seemingly all of his operating theatre thought that was funny. But what is funny is the transparency of their face masks. I mean, they look more like a silk veil than they do a face mask. And I bring this up because as a surgeon, it is so important to help minimalize any contamination of your surgical site, because if it is contaminated, it can lead to infection later on down the line, which could lead to complications and the need for you to take them back to surgery to revise the procedure you've already done. <gasps> And this scene is really interesting, not just because the surgeon isn't wearing any eye protection, but also how the arms look to defend their host, that being Doc Ock. And why this is interesting is because Doc Ock appears to be unconscious here, yet the arms are acting for themselves in defending his body from this inbound threat of this operating sore. And this reminds me of some of the other human unconscious spinal reflexes that we have. For example, the way we move our hand away from a hot or painful stimulus. Now, the reason why these instinctive inbuilt reflexes are so quick is because the sensory information is processed at the spinal cord level rather than traveling up to the brain. And this saves vital seconds with your brain processing the information in prioritizing reducing the damage done to the body. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where the hysterics begin, with all of the operating room staff screaming at the top of their voice. But I think most people would just run. It's interesting looking at the design of the operating theatre. Most of the operating rooms I've been in have been white, and I guess that's so that you can see any dirt or blood anywhere and to keep things as clean as possible. But also the placement of the lighting in this room seems a little bit inefficient. I mean, whenever I've been operating, we have a light that we can move with a modular system just behind our head. And it's so important not to underestimate the usefulness of lighting. But I guess this is in America and in the UK, we might do things a bit different. Oh gosh, and this guy gets electrocuted. And it's interesting to see how he stays grasping onto that blade as he's sort of plugged into that light switch. Now, I guess this could be realistic as it's common during an electrocution that all of the muscles go into contraction, but I would have thought he would have probably dropped down from there. More common injuries that I see with electrocution are that people might have localized skin burns, um, and in some instances, we need to put a monitor onto their heart to make sure they've not gone into a funny rhythm. Oh gosh, and nail clawing. I mean, I don't know what the floor is made out of there, or maybe I should be asking what her nails are made out of to allow her to cling on that tightly. But yeah, her fingernails on a chalkboard, it's one of those things that give you goosebumps and a chill down your spine. But why do so many people hate that noise? Well, research shows that the ear splitting noise of fingernails on a chalkboard is actually of the same frequency of a crying baby. And it's therefore thought that this is actually a mechanism inbuilt for survival. For instance, people's attitude to these frequencies may rescue a crying infant sooner, improving their chance of survival. It's also been pointed out that the shape of the human ear canal has evolved with time to help amplify sounds within this frequency to help promote communication and survival. So our response to fingernails on a chalkboard may well be an unfortunate side effect of an otherwise beneficial evolutionary change in the human body. <laughs> and this scene is so classic of Sam Raimi's directing, where he zooms in on the face and then he zooms in on the chainsaw. It reminds me of his old sort of Evil Dead movies.
And I like here how the tendrils are far more delicate when they help to remove Doc Ock's blindfold. And this plays to the fact that they are being controlled by the cerebellum. And again, remembering that that is involved in coordinating your more precise movements in the body. <laughs> and I don't know why, just watching this now, but this reminds me of the Darth Vader scene at the end of Star Wars Episode 3. But I guess also Doc Ock is beginning to realise that these arms are developing a mind of their own. If anything, they're also beginning to take over his own mind. Now I guess the scary thing about this is that we normally develop computers and machines to perform tasks more efficiently. They take away all of those human aspects that can sometimes distract us from making a decision. Now the scariest thing about this is that computers are target driven, so if they take over Doc Ock's mind, they will ignore all of those human aspects and just pursue what they need to do to get the job done. <laughs> scene, although it's a very small detail, we can see how the tendrils of these machine arms are helping to support Doc Ock whilst he's walking. As we can see, he's a bit off his feet. And this, again, just plays with the fact that these are feeding into his cerebellum, which are involved in your coordination. And then there in the final scene, we see how the tendrils give Doc Ock almost superhuman hearing by detecting these distant police sirens. Interestingly, sound is processed in the midbrain, a structure found between the top of the spinal cord and the brain. And I think what this scene is showing us is how integrated these arms are becoming with Doc Ock. Now, throughout the rest of the movie, we see how Doc Ock's character changes to become more villainous as seemingly the AI takes over more control of his decision making. This of course leads to an awesome fight scene on the train as it passes through New York and I guess the dominance of the AI here could explain how this scientist became an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And ultimately at the end of this movie we see that Doc Ock regains the control of both his body and these arms to help save the day and help save New York. Okay, I hope you found today's video enjoyable and entertaining. Don't forget, if you'd like to see any more breakdowns of other Spider-Man villains, leave their name down below in the comments. Please do give this video a like and support the channel, as it really helps us out. Otherwise, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks.